And now, a message from your very own Maggie Griffin. Hello, hello, everyone. Can you... <laughs> anyway, it's great to see all of you. You're all so great, such great fans. You know, you got to kind of forgive Kathy. Sometimes she gets a little raucous, but... but... <laughs> You know, you listen, you hear her, it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. Just take it for, for what it is. It's just, it's just Kathy. <laughs> so anyway, she's going to have a great show, I, I'm sure. Also, hey, there are t-shirts for sale in the lobby. <laughs> Goodbye and good luck and have fun. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, here she is, the hilarious Kathy Griffin. numbers okay and I'll try to talk about the Kardashians without asking anyone if they have a firearm so I can blow my f-ing brains out <laughs> while I'm at it okay first of all they spent all this money on the wedding and I'm sorry the theme was I don't know if, if she was trying to be Princess Jasmine I she looked like a f-ing belly dancer from the Seven Veil Strip Club With some sort of fucked up forehead necklace that looked like she got it at Claire's at the mall. Sorry. And then they had a runner, like leading up, like, and it was black and white, that was their theme. And then they had their family crest, which I'm telling you, they fucking made up. They don't have a fucking crest. Relax. They just took some letters and matched them up and put them together. Here's our crest. And. And the idea that she marries this guy, what's his name, Chris Humphreys? He's on the Nets, right? All right, I'm just gonna say this. Did... <laughs> I... I love when you guys get visibly nervous. <laughs> because you should be. Um, all right, so the first time I saw a picture of the now husband, Chris Humphreys, um, did anybody else think that he looks a little special needs? <laughs> special needs. Special needs. That's all I'm going to say. No, and I say that with love because I have, I have two dogs, and one of them is a rescue dog named Larry. And yes, I have Larry the dog. He's just fine. He's 100 pounds of love, and um, he's untrainable. I've had Caesar Milan come to the house. He's literally untrainable, and I believe that my dog Larry is autistic. <laughs> yeah, I'm living on the edge, Costa Mesa. I'm going there. I, I, I know that's a, a sensitive subject, but I believe that I have an autistic dog. Um, <laughs> I get emotional when I talk about the autistic canine community. Anyway, so, so, uh, 
so anyway, uh, Kim Kardashian got married, and I thought the wedding was such like a freaking Persian conversion, Armenian nightmare from hell. <laughs> Yeah, I'm saying it because nobody else has the balls to. Okay, here's the part that kills me. She reportedly got paid $17 million. I know, just to get married in the first place. So that doesn't even count all of, like the product placement that who knows. And you know, the gift bag was all like product placement. So the gift bag was her perfume and like, I don't know what, like all the stuff with their names on it and their branding and shit. So that was a real treat for the guests, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> One of the guests, by the way, was my boyfriend, Justin Bieber. I... And you know, they had a virtual wedding guest book. Yes, because as if there weren't enough people at that wedding, they wanted to make sure that all the fans could leave their vir virtual message. Well, I left one. It was a simple you. And, but I did do like XOXO, Kathy. To bounce up. Now, you know that um, they were both tweeting up a storm because they have millions of followers on Twitter. And so this is their big day. And the wedding has been a little bit shrouded in secrecy until it airs and all this other stuff. So I wanted to read you some of their twats. I wrote them down. <laughs> yes. I do my homework, I do my research and development. And so keeping in mind, I, I was looking on their Twitter to see anything that maybe wouldn't be on the special or anything maybe fun or embarrassing. All right, I'm now quoting. Kim's, Kim's twat for her wedding day was as follows. Today is the day. <laughs> really, $17 million? Angry. Um, Another one uh, that Kim twatted was anxious, excited, emotional. Three words to describe what I'm feeling right now, which is three more than I thought she knew. <laughs> Thumbs up. Chris twatted, this is it. And I thought, easy, Michael Jackson, take it easy. <laughs> so, what was she looking through Netflix? Um, Oh, the mom had the best dress ever. Did you see this? Because Kim's dress was beautiful, Vera Wang. And the mom had this f up dress with just a big ass bow, a big giant bow, like a bow tie across her tits. Oh, you know Bruce chose it. He was like, go girl. Um, <laughs> by the way, I, maybe I'm dating myself here, but does anybody remember when Bruce Jenner was Bruce f Jenner? Bruce Jenner, Olympic champion, American hero. Now the guy's had more face work than I have. You know, he's got like the drag queen eyebrows. He wears foundation and blush and lipstick. I don't know this for a fact, like most of the things I'm gonna say, but I have a theory that you know that when they finish taping that show for the day and the crew leaves and they close the door, you know he and puts on Kim's clothes and her wigs. He goes, I'm Kim, I'm Kim. Um, Bruce Jenner, always a bridesmaid, never the bride. I, oh, that is evil. All right, so the Kardashian wedding has become, uh, this is the phrase that drives me crazy, is when people say, they're as close as we have to American royalty. Thank you, appropriate, thank you, appropriate reaction. Because I would say that they're as close as what we have to a family of dirty whores. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I will I you down to the nub. I will, oh yeah, I'm a big I watch. Anybody sore? I think we're gonna have to talk about Casey Anthony right now. Yeah, we're going there. We are going there. You can handle it, Costa Mesa. All right, so first of all, I, I'm just gonna say, and I, you know, it's TV, so I don't know what I can say legally. She killed that kid. Let me just say, she killed that kid. All right, now I'll rephrase it for TV. In my opinion, in the Casey Anthony case, it appeared to me as a simple viewer that she may be guilty of the crime and yet the jury did not agree. <laughs> um, but 
let me tell you what I think is the real story when it comes to Casey Anthony, and that's a lady named Nancy Grace. Yeah, that's right. Nancy Grace has f***ing had it with Tot Mom. Had it with Tot Mom. I don't know how she came up with the name Tot Mom. I don't give a shit. It's f***ing funny. I love Tot Mom. I, by the way, have renamed her Hot Mom. Yes. No, no, hear me out. And by the way, I don't know if she was like f***ing the lawyer or what, but let me tell you, that lawyer, Jose Baez, I am alleging, I do not know, I think she blew that guy the day she met him. <laughs> That's the hot mom. Like their first meeting, she was like, my kid's missing. Are these knee pads okay? Come on. <laughs> I'm just saying hot mom has an agenda. Now, did anybody happen to see when hot mom did her per perp walk in the pink t-shirt? Did you catch this <laughs> And I was like, did she? I'm by myself like this. Did she just f Did she just I f the f Holy sh hot mom. She's just I f the f guard. Um, now, that was, I think, the final straw because Nancy Grace cannot stop her head from exploding. And that's what I'm loving about watching my Nancy during this case because Nancy Grace, you know, and it, it, I don't know if you know this because she never mentions it, um, she's a former prosecutor. Yeah, it never comes up on her show, <laughs> except every 17 seconds. You know, I'm a former prosecutor. As a former prosecutor, there's one thing I know. I used to be a prosecutor. I am not a defense attorney. If I was to walk into a prosecutor's office, I would know where to go. I was one myself. I was a prosecuting attorney, and we did not put up with any of that guff. As a prosecuting attorney, I'm a former prosecuting attorney, but let me tell you what I know about prosecution as an attorney who practiced in prosecution. So, She also was obviously very upset with the verdicts because I watched that day, and I cannot believe this in all my years as a prosecuting attorney, which is what I did for a living. I have never seen a celebration party like this after so-called top mom Casey Anthony somehow got acquitted. I do not understand that one. And then just a block away, I look, and they're having some kind of a champagne jamboree. <laughs> Let's sit with that one for a second. I love the Nancy Grace Southern colloquialisms champagne jamboree. I don't know exactly what that is, but my poker chips are f***ing all in. I love it. <laughs> champagne jamboree. And I don't even know what that means. I don't know if Nancy is dressed like Minnie Pearl from Hee Haw with a little price tag hanging off her hat. Champagne Jamboree, I don't know if they're a funnel cakes or a mule team or a petting zoo. I don't know what that is, but I'm going. And then, and if Nancy has just about had it, then she has to call in for help. Her other correspondent, and I also am obsessed with her, Jane Velez Mitchell. Yes, Jane Velez Mitchell is also on HLN and she's rocking the mullet, rocking the mullet. Nancy, I agree. You know, this is ridiculous. This verdict is shocking to me as well. And I thought I'd seen everything in this business, Nancy. And I understand you were a former prosecutor. And I myself... <laughs> and Jane is great because she's always trying to sell her book about addiction and recovery. So in the middle of anything, she'll say, you know, I do not want to take part of that champagne jabbery because if I have champagne, it will trigger me as a 12-step member. And I've got a story to tell about addiction and recovery. Anyway, back to you, Nancy. That is a f***ing double team dream come true. I... Now, Jade Velez Mitchell, JVM. All right, now, I will admit, though, that even though I saw, you know, one of the most hated people on the planet doing it, I am an admitted I f Yeah, I, I, I will I f you down to the nub. I will... Oh, yeah, I'm a big I f Watch. Are you sore? Anybody sore? <laughs> I will I f you so hard, you're gonna need a condom, a dental dam, two bottles of lube. Yes. I am an I f 
here now and forever. Now, granted, I'm not good at it, and so often when I'm walking down the street, I f***ing someone, the guy will just look at me like this. <laughs> Which means he wants me more, he just doesn't know how to express it. So, no, no, I'm one of those crazy people, because you know I go on like these walks and hikes every single day, I'm like a super crazy walker, and so when I'm walking, I'm also, I f so I'm that person that if you're going on a walk somewhere, if you're in a park somewhere, you'll see me and I will, I, f I can't even help it. It's just innate. And so, and by the way, it's really sexy. I hope you can handle it when I do it to you because it's usually me in like a three-year-old jog bra and um, my walking pants giving you full camel toe. Full, yes. Whether I'm in the desert or not, I'm bringing my camel toe. And then my bangs up, my hair in a ponytail, and flop sweat. It is sexy. And that's me. All right, so you've waited long enough. We have to talk about Marcus Bachman right now. Right now. Here's why. Okay. I, in, you know, my last special, I told a story, a true story, about having kind of a run-in with Michelle Bachman, who's a dumbass and yes all right so you know I, I as a citizen I don't think she's so great but as a comedian she is heaven now if you saw her on the cover of Newsweek then I love you I love you Costa Mesa okay so she had the crazy eyes right and that was a photo shoot that she agreed to, by the way. So there she was on the cover of Newsweek with eyes like Ramona from The Real Housewives of New York City. So to any Republicans that are here tonight, just remember when you go into the voting booth, you may be voting for President Ramona. All right, so she's obviously made some very stupid and outrageous statements, but just when I thought we were done with her, and yes, this is a pun, the husband's coming up the rear. <laughs> All right, if you are not aware of Marcus B Bachman, please allow me. Now, he is Michelle Bachman's husband. He could be the first dude, and he is a psychiatrist or psychologist or some kind of f***ing fake doctor, I don't know, but... <laughs> but you should know that he has... Um, in Minnesota, I'm going to try not to laugh, <clears throat> he actually has a reparative clinic where he tries to de-gay people. <laughs> yes. Which, by the way, always works. Um, yeah, you know what? I had a reparative clinic also. It was called high school, okay? <laughs> it did work then. to the prom with the gay guy. I had a gay boyfriend. I spent four years saying, is it me? And then he was looking over my shoulder to a guy named Jason. Um, but anyway, I, uh, oh wait, I have to share something with you. Okay, Marcus Bachman, I'm, like, once again, I've done my homework. So we can make fun of Marcus Bachman. And yet at the same time, I'd like to read you a direct quote for how Marcus Bachman, not the most forward thinking person, what he has to say about the gay community. Okay. We have to understand barbarians need to be educated. I know. In this, okay. Um, <laughs> sometimes you don't actually have to write the joke, you just kind of let it. All right, so then he says about gay, probably gay guys in general, but let's say LGBT community. Then he says <clears throat> they need to be disciplined. place for that, okay? I mean, he doesn't know what he's talking about, but I know that some of you have been in a ball gag and a zipper mask within the last week. And then his choice of words, of course, bespeaks his own intellect, which is, he then says without irony, just because someone feels it or thinks it doesn't mean that we are supposed to go down that road. said go down. <laughs> Look, I don't know this guy, I've never met him, but he sucks c <laughs> Okay, let's cut the shit. I'm
Costa Mesa. All you chicks look alike. Cut the sh They all got the blonde hair. They all have the same exact tits. If I went around this room with a hat pin, it would sound like a kid's party. Wait a minute. Can we talk about Real Housewives of New Jersey for one second? I enjoy your enthusiasm. All right, so, so this season on Housewives of Jersey, Teresa seems to be having some financial problems to the tune of about, oh, I don't know, I think it's $11 million. You know how sometimes you kind of get behind in your bills and you go to the mall and you buy that one shirt too many and then you're $11 million in debt? It's very relatable. And I find that the way to deal with being in $11 million of debt is to wear more makeup. That seems to be her plan. But we can't expect a lot because her sister-in-law, Melissa, is also delivering the goods. And Melissa is the one who, and I know this is a shocker, wants to be a singer. Isn't that weird that somebody on The Real Housewives wants to be a singer? Wow, with no training. Isn't that weird? With absolutely the Countess. All right, so. So crazy. So now the uh, sister-in-law, Melissa, wants to be a singer. And so there was this great moment in one of the episodes where she was visiting with some friends and bragging about how there was a prediction that she was going to do well because they had seen a median. <laughs> Not something that would divide a road, but, <laughs> you know, you, you may want to consult a median to see how your future is going to unfurl. And then there was a great moment because I thought, okay, maybe in the moment she just said something, you know, by mistake. I've certainly done that a million times. But no, then when they do the sit down, really glamorous, glossy interview with the good lighting, she's sticking with it. So normally I don't believe in a median, but now that I heard that from a median, it could happen. <laughs> you go, girl. Um, and you know, I'm not gonna, I'm never gonna give up on my Housewives of Orange County. I'm not going to. That's right. I have been there from the beginning and I'm still there. So I, okay, so you know, they kind of recycle them like Menudo. Have you noticed that? Right? It's like Menudo. And um, I, you know, I was there from the beginning with the beginning group and now, of course, they still have that crazy Vicky, right? Who somehow, oh my God, I'm so pissed because I'm fing single and she's banging a new guy already. I'm fing pissed. Seriously? The f All right, so. And they all live in that Cota de Cozy or Cota de Cozy or whatever the f it is. It's like a f up Orange County gingerbread land. What the hell? They all look alike. I can't tell the girls alike. I can't tell the homes alike. Okay, let's cut the shit. I'm in Costa Mesa. All you chicks look alike. Cut the shit. They all got the blonde hair. They all have the same exact tits. If I went around this room with a hat pin, it would sound like a kid's party. <laughs> Big. All right, so, oh, I brought something special for you. Wait a minute. Can I please read you my favorite prison fan letter? Um, okay, so, it, to be, to be honest, and just to tell you a little about, about who I am, I am kind of like America's sweetheart. Um, <laughs> a lot of men find me bewitching, and they fall in love with me, and I can't help it. I'm only human. So I'd like to share with you someone expressing their love to me. And yes, he's incarcerated for now. <laughs> People change, especially guys. Anyway, his name is Wispa. <laughs> um, so he writes, <clears throat> Hello, Miss Griffith. <laughs> really? Even in prison, I'm on the fing D list. <laughs> Hello, Miss Griffith. Oh, by the way, and I'll go back to the letter in a second. Okay, so you know I've performed in a maximum security prison. Did you see that on my life on the D-list? Okay. So what happened was um, I decided to like challenge myself as a stand-up comedian. I don't know what the f was the matter with me. It was so f scary. Oh, and by the way, when they get when they gave me the briefing for like what happens if shit goes down, and yeah, I'm talking all street now, like fucking Huggy Bear from an old rerun of Starsky and Hutch. <laughs> 
you're a jive turkey. Anyway, um, <laughs> so I, I met with the warden and I said, well, you know, obviously I'd be curious to know how do you guys handle it? What is the protocol if anything happens? I'm not suggesting that any kind of a riot would happen, but I've, I'm sure you've had incidents and what is the protocol? And I swear to God, the warden said, run. <laughs> Excuse me, I don't, it sounded like you said run. He goes, yeah, run. I go, where? And he goes, anywhere. <laughs> so we then were filming on death row, or as they call it, the row, because I'm totally in with that posse. I don't know if you've met Wispa, um, but he loves Miss Griffith. So, so we were walking through death row, and then there was a woman in her cell, and she yelled out, I'm going to kill you. Um, which can be unsettling, um, only because I know she's actually done it before. So, so I just sort of let it pass, thinking, you know, this must be, you know, der rigueur for the prison. And then the warden said, okay, that is not acceptable. And I said, oh no, that's, that's fine, don't worry about it. And he goes, no, you know what, Miss Griffin, I need you to go over there and she's, I'm gonna make her apologize to you. <laughs> right, thank you. I know, and I was like this, no, no, I'm good, I'm good. I mean, whatever she says, she didn't mean it. She's probably tired. Tired. She made me. I'm good. So, I swear to God, they walk me over to the cell, and he has a conversation with her, and then through the little bar, she goes like this, I'm sorry, I ain't gonna kill you. I know, that's why I think I could someday be Mrs. Wispa. Um, <laughs> a little more about my new relationship. He also says, he just right out the gate says, I am Wispa, one of your biggest, blackest convict fans. I am currently incarcerated for armed robbery and I have been in here for five years. Well, we all go through phases. I must ask if you will send me a photo of you to put on my locker, maybe a bikini shot. Seriously, he's only human, right guys? Yeah. Um, you are way finer than Paris. Really? Oh, whisper. And then he says, can't you see us? Big black greasy convict with the red-headed diva. So he's like thinking it through, I kind of like that. And then, just when I thought we were getting along, he says, hey, I don't see you much anymore on TV. Ouch, ouch. I saw you on TMZ in an old version of Cribs, which is weird, because if he was convicted for armed robbery, he <laughs> all right. Um, and then he says, um, I hope I don't creep you out. I ain't no nutcase, okay? I know, so now I don't know like if we've had our first fight or... <laughs> I gotta calm whisper the f down. <laughs> and then it gets a little philosophical. The world is so full of <laughs> But believe me, there are still some real angels left in the city. And then he gives me his um, angelic name. What, you guys don't have an angelic name? <laughs> Mine's pussy. Anyway, <laughs> he says, my angelic name is Mikael. The Archangel which defeated Satan. Or Oprah. Um, oh, but hold on, things are turning around. I am studying business and real estate, which I support because if you've been convicted for armed robbery, you wanna get that real estate license. Stat. My goal is to be worth $13.5 billion within 10 years after my release. You know what I like about this? It's not just 13.5 million or 13.5 dollars. No. Wispa shoots for the moon. Okay. I don't want a rice paper vagina. I want a Berlin Wall, mother Yeah. and they had just the littlest tremor. No pictures fell off the wall. And by the way, they tried to evacuate me. And I don't know about you, but I um, am always pantsless. <laughs> no, whatever, 
When, so the guy comes to my door in the hotel, and I'm just wearing panties and like an old, you know, nasty t-shirt. And so I just said, no, I'm not leaving. And I don't have pants on. And I don't know where they are. But I swear to God, I am a pantsless mother If you are coming to my house, the minute someone rings the bell is when I'm taking a pee. If there's a delivery, it's, there's no, it's a no pants situation. So I was not going to flood through the streets without pants. So I was like, please, I live in California. I think I'm, we're gonna be okay. <laughs> I wanna dazzle you with a dinner that I had and I hope you're impressed by this. So I decided for my 50th birthday, I wanted to do something really, really special. So I asked feminist icon Gloria Steinem to dinner. Come on, Gloria Steinem, people. worship Gloria Steinem and everything she stands for and stuff. And I feel like there's nobody like her now. Like no one's really taken that mantle and stuff. So I said, can we please go to dinner? But I'm going to be honest with you guys. I was just out of like a, a really tough breakup. And one of the questions I wanted to ask to her of all people is how do you get a relationship with a dude when you're like a ballsy chick? Because my balls are like, they're like basketballs. Like they're just, I try to tuck them and it's, it's work. But anyway... And by the way, we, we ate at a vegan restaurant, which was a nightmare. That was a f***ing nightmare. Those vegans can suck my dick with their... I am sorry. I... I want a good steak and a good f***ing sumi. All right, so... So, so anyway, um, during the dinner, she was lovely and she's so intelligent. And we were talking about women's issues and the history of the feminist movement. But I'm going to be honest, the whole time, I'm kind of working up to the question, which is, will a man ever love me? Right? I am not kidding. I, I know. And so I'm thinking, well, I've got to couch it in something or maybe I could reference an article in the New Yorker. So finally, like at the end of the meal, I just blurt it out and I go, um, so I just broke up with this guy and I totally am a feminist, but I still like want to have sex with guys who might like me. What do I do? It was so pathetic. It was so pathetic. And so she's like very calm and cool. And she said, well, have you started menopause yet? And I said, yes. And it's a nightmare. I get flop sweat. It's horrible. And she goes, well, the good news is once you go through menopause, you're not going to care about romance or sex or any of that nonsense. I know. And she goes, and also your vaginal wall will get thinner. In fact, it'll basically turn into rice paper. <laughs> became obsessed with my vaginal lining and how to thicken that up, right? So I started going on those Suzanne Summers recommended hormone creams. Holy balls, I was rubbing them all over. I'm rubbing them on my titties, rubbing them up my butt. I was putting them anywhere, Put up here. I was like putting buckets. I was like, more and more. And I don't want a rice paper vagina. I want a Berlin Wall, mother yeah. And let me tell you something. It is now like a Goodyear f***ing tire, okay? It is like a Goodyear tire. I could put a semi on my back and drive through the city. My vagina could run over a nail and not even feel it. And God Gloria Steinem, she's certainly a better person than I am, but I will still believe in nonsense. And then she was like, and then you can do important things like go to India and make beads. Holy <laughs> balls. I just want to get a bead up my pussy and say thank you, good night. So, because we're in California, I have to tell you yet another embarrassing story. So I, I don't know if you know this, but I've never had a drink in my life. Truly, I've never had a drink. It's true. Um, no, I just have never had a desire to drink, and my fear is loosening up more. <laughs> you know, like when guys always want to be the first one to give me a drink, and I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> really. My pants are already off. I will I f you, and then I'll f you with my pussy. Are we good? So... No thanks. So anyway, um, I, <laughs> okay, I don't know why I did this once again. I did this for the first time at 50. I was a stoner for a week. Yes, Kathy Griffin, huge stoner, big stoner. So, so embarrassing.
embarrassing. So I'm trying to like learn the lingo, right? So I did, I don't know about pot or I wouldn't know how to get pot. And I don't know why I thought this, but I swear to God, I mean, I certainly have enough comedian friends who smoke pot. I should know this. And I thought it was called the chief. Am I the only person who calls it that? Really? Okay, so I thought I was so in. So I started talking to my comedian friends, being like, hey man, can you score me some chief? <laughs> yeah, I just want to know what it feels like. Uh, I'm thinking of hitting the chief later. Do you have a contact for the chief? What's the chief going for? I'd like a nickel bag. <laughs> and all my pothead friends are like, what the f are you talking about? <laughs> I was like, Pot is there. No, it's not the chief. So I now just lovingly call it the chief. Okay, so I was in Palm Springs in the safety of a hotel, and I thought, I'm going to try the chief and see what happens. So um, someone who works for Team Griffin, who shall go unnamed, Tiffany, had a friend. <laughs> and I, I said, I want to just commit to having the chief. And Tiffany was laughing, and she's like, we don't, even, we don't smoke the chief. I was like, I know, this is one time, let's go crazy. And um, her friend brought over a chief brownie, right? And it was pretty big. And here's what I didn't know about potheads. I didn't know that pot brownies can taste good. Like, I thought they would just taste like old ashes or something. I didn't know that it's just normal brownies with a little chief in there, but a, a ton of butter. And I love butter. And I like chocolate. And I was already, like, in a bed, so I couldn't, like, trip and do shit. Like, I can fly, man. I can fly. Because that, you know that that's what I thought would happen. Like, I'm so old school that I thought I'd be on the ledge. I can do it, man. We're going to Mars. So, so embarrassing. So, um, so we have the brownie, and you should have seen us. Three grown women open this brownie just laughing and, like, making fun of ourselves. And then uh, her friend said, okay, since it's your first chief brownie, you should just have, like, a fifth of it. So you know what happened, right? I take a fifth or eat a, whatever you call it, smoke a fifth. or I don't even know what it was. I ate. It was like a brownie. It was just a brownie. And it had chocolate chunks, which I love. Um... <laughs> So then, of course, I eat it and nothing happens. And then I have some more and nothing happens. And I was like, oh my gosh, as usual, I'm a scientific anomaly and I'm the one person on the planet that is immune to the chief. So I ate the whole thing. And <laughs> Yeah, I know. It was bad, but also tasted good. Like, I, after a while, I forgot about the chief part. I was like, this is a good brownie. So, <laughs> so um, they kept warning me. And then I think when Tiffany, your friend, left, there was like half a brownie left. And she was saying, OK, save this and all this stuff. I was like, whatever, kids. <laughs> and when it hit me, <laughs> OK, so I just, all right. So I thought it had no effect on me, so I was like, potheads are so f***ing exaggerating. This doesn't even do anything to me. I'm just going to go to bed. So I um, sit in my bed in the hotel room, and I'm flipping around the TV, because I watch TV like all night, every night, till 5 in the morning. And then I'm flipping around CNBC, and I see my pal Susie Orman. And, you know, I love Susie Orman. She's great. She gives me the financial advice. And because I know her and was watching her show, I could not tell when she was inside the TV <laughs> and when she was sitting next to me. Which, it turns out, I found the next day, she was not in the room. <laughs> I imagined it, courtesy of the chief. So I'm watching Susie, and then I felt um, the bed was like a vibration bed. <laughs> And it was weird because the mattress was moving separately from the frame of the bed. And then I noticed the photos on the wall changed size. Some of them actually grew bigger and then would retract to their original size. And I remember thinking I should talk to the manager of the hotel. Yeah because I should get a discount. This could be disorienting <laughs> to people, but here's all I know, it's very nice. And then uh, Tiffany called me, because she and her friend went out, and she said, I just want to check in with you. And then I laughed for seven minutes. <laughs> and she got a little nervous. 
And then she said, okay, now we're scared. We're going to come check on you, which I thought was the funniest thing I'd ever heard in my life. So I was like, whatever. And then I remember thinking, I better put the pictures back to their original size. <laughs> about my weekend at Anderson Cooper's house. I sent him a picture of me in front of his fireplace in his underwear. And then he wrote back, finding everything okay? All right, you want to hear about my weekend at Anderson Cooper's house? All right, so you know, I've talked about him before and I love doing New Year's Eve with him on CNN and stuff. And I'm by far his most embarrassing friend, by far. But I also want to say, most exciting. I'm by far his most exciting friend. And I proved it last weekend. Now, he foolishly invited me to his house in uh, Connecticut, right? So he's got like, you know, the East Coast people have their vacation house and stuff. So I do not understand that scene. I'm a city gal. And um, to me, when I go into the country, I just sweat and my hair frizzes. And I don't want to get in the water unless it's maybe an infinity tub at the Four Seasons. I... Love a hotel. So I admit I am not a good host because, once again, don't have pants. I rarely have pants on. Um, so I also admit that I'm not the greatest guest. And I, I rarely stay with anybody. You know, I'll always choose a hotel. But of, he offered, and it was very kind and foolish, because he gave me the keys to his house to go a night before because he had to do the news, like his real job. And um, so I went the night before, and it was a nice house and everything. But I thought it would be funny if, um, <laughs> while he was, um, covering the revolt in Tripoli, you know, just a light little story. So I thought it'd be funny if I took really f up pictures of myself in his house. <laughs> so, <laughs> and sent them to him during the news. <laughs> Okay, so the first one I sent was, um, it was just me and my underwear passed out on his floor. Because I wanted him to think that I fell and hurt myself or just took too many drugs and passed out or something. So I sent him that one, and I thought for sure he was going to write back, you know, like, hee hee or LOL. So he, there's a picture of me in my underwear passed out on his floor, and he sends back, how's everything going? <laughs> so I can tell I'm freaking him out, right? Then... Trying to be a good guest, but not being a good guest, I got him this pie. He has a favorite bakery in New York, so I got him his favorite pie. And then I was sitting there in his house, and then it just looked good, so I started eating it. <laughs> so I took a picture of myself at his dining room table wearing his glasses, just eating his pie. <laughs> Send. And um, during the news, no response. So then um, I took a picture. I put, oh, I put on all of his underwear. So... <laughs> So I put on his boxers, and, um, and I wore a bra, because I'm a lady, and um, <laughs> I have class, and then I had on these like, big whore heels that I bought for a party, and then I sent him a picture of me in front of his fireplace in his underwear, and then he wrote back, finding everything okay? 